family. Can't live with them, and sometimes you can't live without them. I found this quote, altered it a little bit. By the way, all those TV families came from a TV guide, kind of like a website. All the correct answers are available for you at the back. You can fact check me at tvguide.com, something like that. But they had this, family ties bind us. We invite TV dynasties into the middle of our full houses, whether we live in Beverly Hills, Bel Air, or Mayberry, upstairs or downstairs, for happy days and good times. Watching married with children characters one day at a time becomes an all-in-the-family affair for the wonder years and brings about home improvement at times. That's why modern families matter and can take us to seventh heaven, even if they're fresh off the boat. I had a hard time picking which three families uh, my family of origin might look like. One was rather easy, but it was some alterations. Everybody loves Raymond. Uh, minus the comedy, and uh, but with multiple divorces and remarriages. That was, uh, the second one was The Symptoms, Simpsons, although I've never watched The Simpsons. They just seem like the most dysfunctional uh, family on TV, uh, even though I've never watched it. Uh, my family was definitely uh, dysfunctional. I couldn't come up with a third that portrayed lots of anger and alcohol um, combinations. So those were my family. So family... Can't live with them sometimes and can't live without them. So there's a different kind of family we're going to talk about today. It's the family of God, your church family. Um, Family is not something you just attend unless you want to stay away and just show up at Thanksgiving, Easter, and Christmas meals, right? Uh, Family is, on the other hand, something you're part of something you belong to. It's, with, it's people with which whom you interact. Uh, it's a people who make a contribution to your life, to your growth, and towards whom you make a valuable contribution. Family is not a gathering of strangers, unless it's one of those weird family reunions uh, that your parents make you go to. Um, family is or should be people you can count on and who can count on you. Family is people to whom you are related and whom you should be deeply connected to. And family is made up of people who love you, should be anyway, and whom you should love. Now I know in human families, sometimes that's, that's all that's hard. But we're thinking beyond that. We're thinking about the family of God. Family was a term that was used to describe by Jesus his followers. Family is a term that should describe Church. Last week we looked at the term body, that we are the body of Christ, thinking of spiritual giftedness, abilities that God has given us uh, to, to bless and serve and encourage and help one another in this journey of faith that we're on. But in Mark chapter 3, verses 31 through 34, I'm just going to read this. We're not going to camp out here, but I want you to see something that Jesus said. Uh, it says, Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. That means they showed up where Jesus was. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. Because there's such a large crowd, they couldn't get in. So they sent someone in, and a crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. And Jesus looked at the crowd that was there in front of him and said, who are my mother and brothers, he asked. No, he's setting them up. I mean, he knew who his mom and his brothers were, right? So he's, he's not... He's not saying anything. He's not dissing them. He said, then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my brother uh, and brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So he's, in effect, redefining family or giving a different dimension to the understanding of family and giving a different um, context for us to think about the, the, the people that we know that also uh, follow Christ. Now Jesus, in, in this analogy uh, of family, uh, talked about being born again. John, one of his followers, uh, recorded that in John chapter 3. Now you're very familiar with at least one verse in John chapter 3, most people are, that says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Most people have heard that verse. 
Uh, but in that same chapter of the third chapter of John, Jesus uh, said to a very religious, moral, uh, outstanding young man, maybe probably not quite so young, he said, uh, you must be, what? Born again. Born again. There's a new life I want you to have. There's a new life I want you to have that is not just a life of religious duty and, 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 and ceremony and lifelessness. There's a life that I want you to have. And Jesus called it being born again. Of course, when you're born, you're born into a family. You should be. Born into a family. Uh, Paul also used the analogy of family uh, when he wrote in, in Ephesians chapter 1 to a group of believers in a city called Ephesus, uh, but he didn't use the new birth analogy. He used adoption as the analogy. We were once not in God's family, but God invites us into his family. And when we say yes, the official transaction occurs. Unlike going to an orphanage or to China, and, and, and the many people that I know have done, and, and or other countries, I know Russia and Korea and I could start thinking, but uh, and and adopting a child, usually that infant child has nothing to say back about it, right? Like, nope, can't, not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to stay here where I am. I kind of like life the way it is, so I don't want to be adopted. You know, it's kind of a little bit ridiculous, but the the, the term adoption in in Ephesians implies, uh, and and Paul teaches this, that we basically have to adopt our father back. We have to accept the adoption. We have to uh, choose Christ. And, and there's that analogy there, but it also is teaching us about the importance of family. And, and that makes us brothers and sisters. Now, down south, they really play that up. Brother Jeff. Brother Jeff. Uh, in, in the south, I was Brother J.F., I spent 10 weeks in Mississippi, and I was J-F. It's like J-A-E-F-F. It had two syllables for the first time in my life. I kind of liked it. Um, J-F, brother. But it's like, I don't know if it's, I haven't been down south in churches in a long time, but I used to spend a lot of time down there. Uh, You know, brother and sister. Now, they probably said that to each other, but sometimes they may not, may or may not have acted like it. I, I don't know. I can't say. I'm not sitting in any kind of judgment. But it's more than just a term. It's more than just, hey, brother Mark. Hey, brother Lance. Hey, sister Jenny. Uh, but really, all the people that are followers of Christ are brothers and sisters. We have the same father. Last time I checked, all those who have the same father are in the same family. So we're all in the family. If you're a follower of Christ, all in the family. Now, over the past few weeks, we've been taking a look at this subject of church. Uh, Jesus promised that he would build his church. And you know what? That's one of my, that's a very important promise, prophecy, because you know why? It includes me and you. That's why we're here today, because Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. And death, the gates of Hades, is not going to prevail against it. Not his death, not the death of his followers. Nothing is going to overcome his church because his church is about eternal life. So he loves his church, Paul wrote, and gave himself for it. We should love his church. Acts depicts the church that Christ builds. Dr. Luke, in his investigative reporting, uh, recorded the, the birth of the very first church in, in, the, in what we know as the book of Acts, a document that he wrote. We call it, I don't know why we call it books. I don't know why we call them books of the Bible. They're documents that were written. Uh, some of them were letters. Um, Acts wasn't, yeah, well, Acts was a letter. He wrote it to a guy by the name of Theophilus. So anyway, he, he depicts uh, the birth and the growth of that very first church that sprung up in Jerusalem after Christ ascended. Uh, any church that wants to be a real church will follow the model laid out in the book of Acts. Uh, so it, it's, it's our architectural design. Church means gathering. That's what the word, in Greek it would sound something like ekklesia. You've heard of ecclesiastical. 
uh, usually refers to churchy or denomination or people that wear the religious garb as pastors. And, and, and I'm not making fun of any of that, but that the term literally means gathering. Gathering. Has nothing to do with a building. Has nothing to do with a time like the holy hour, Sunday morning at 11 o'clock or whatever. You know, that's Baptist standard time. Some people have joked. Uh, that has anything to do with the, that anything to do with the denomination. It's a gathering. In, in the New Testament, there's examples of a political gathering, but they didn't translate that word church. They translated it assembly or gathering. The other hundred plus times, uh, that word is translated church, but it doesn't mean building. It doesn't mean uh, it means it means gathering. So this some of the this, this is review. Uh, each follower of Christ, what we've seen in this gathering, this is a gathering with a purpose. It's a, it's a movement that doesn't stand still. And every follower of Christ is gifted with abilities. The Bible calls them spiritual gifts that are used in service to fellow followers. You have gifts and abilities that God has given you as a follower of Christ, that He wants you to employ. He wants you to put into practice. He wants you to use. And you'll find your higher meaning and calling in life by employing that in service to one another. It's part of how you were designed. It's part of how you were made. He designs hammers to be hammers, screwdrivers to be screwdrivers, Uh, Crowbars to be crowbars, and they all have very specific purposes, and you have a unique design that God has given to you. Now, Paul, who entered the scene as Saul of Tarsus, you've heard of the Damascus Road experience. Well, he's the guy that had the first one. Uh, He hated Christians. He hated church. He was on his way to a city called Damascus, Uh, to wreak havoc with people that were followers of Christ and having them, he had letters of permission to have them thrown into prison and he's on his way to Damascus and he encountered the resurrected Christ. That's what changed him. He encountered the resurrected Christ. He did not decide to adopt adopt the, the doctrine and beliefs of Christianity. He encountered the resurrected Christ and as a result... He was the author of much of that doctrine and what we call doctrine about Christianity. So now Saul wrote this. He he was personally involved. He he did several trips around the Mediterranean Rim, at least three different journeys. And he visited uh, key port cities. And he would preach and he would teach and he would share and he would pray and he would love on people and people would start following Christ. And those people would gather together and and, uh, churches sprung up. And so he would write letters. When he wasn't with them anymore, he would write letters back to them. And that's at least 13 of the documents we have in our New Testament. He wrote letters back to churches, most of which he'd already been to, some of which he had never been to, but he still felt some kind of spiritual connection and uh, uh, responsibility for it just to help them grow in their faith. So he wrote this, what I'm going to read now, um, to a church in the city of Thessalonica. Uh, and, and this is what we would call 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Now, about your love for one another. I just notice how many times the word love pops up in these two verses. Pops up. Uh, I don't know, I didn't count one. I'm look, look at what, one, two, three times. And look at the, uh, the number of times the reference is to God's family or brothers and sisters uh, pops up. Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia, not just there in their little town of Thessalonica, which may not have been so litty, little, um, uh, all, all throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so, to do what? To love more and more. So there's, there's some things that come out of this passage of Scripture that are very, very uh, instructive uh, to, to us and to any church and to any follower of Christ. Now look at this. 1 Thessalonians 4.9 tells us that love 
is learned from God. So now if you're taking notes, you can do that on the back of the bulletin. You can actually, if you download the Spring Hills app, you can actually uh, type that in on your smartphone and save that, and you'll have those notes forevermore. You can go to your favorite app store, download that. In fact, I give you permission to do that right now, except there's not Wi-Fi in the building, so I hope you got a good connection. Uh, So love is learned from God. Love is learned from God. Now, now there's two ways that it's learned from God. Look what he says. Love has been taught. Love love is the way the Father relates to us as his children. That's one way that it's learned. But but it's not just learned from God uh, like children watching their father, which is uh, one, one way we can learn it. Love is, secondly, received from God. Received. Now, I, 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 want you to, I want you to tune in on this. Love is received from God. We're going to jump over to 1 John. Another um, follower of Christ wrote uh, some documents that we have in our New Testaments. Uh, he wrote the Gospel according to John. He wrote three smaller little documents called 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. He's also the human author of, of the document that's the last one in our New Testament, which is... Revelation. That's John. Okay. So in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, writing to fellow followers, um, look at what it says. It says that he has lavished his love on us. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Lavish. Now, what do you think of when you think of lavish? Give me, give me some synonyms. Lavish. What do you got? Is it poor? Is it uh, poverty? Or is it rich in wealth, in abundance? Right? That, that's lavish. Lavish literally means more than enough. Way more than enough. He has lavished His love on us. See what great love. See how great the love of the Father is. John just has this heartbeat, and he, he just wants the followers of Christ to know how great God loves them. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. That we, it's like we get to be called the children of God. Like, wow, what a privilege. Uh, but it's more than just He's lavished His love on us. He's done something within us as well. Or He will. This may not be true of you yet, but it can be. Uh, before you leave today, it can be true of you. He also has given us... Now, Now this, and you guys are smart, and I know you're going to be able to follow this, but you know, tune in here. Uh, he has given us His nature. He has given us His nature. We're going to look at 1 John chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. So look, this is what it says. No one who is born of God, there's that idea of birth again. No one who is born of God. Now what that simply means is God gives us a new life. God gives us a a do-over. And the do-over that He gives us is not the same as the previous one before we did the do-over. In fact, He's the one that does the do-over. So he has, he has given us His name. Now follow along here. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. And let me explain that. What it means is they will not continue uh, to, to sin just because their life now is different. Now, I'm going to make some connections here. Because God's seed remains in Him. Now, when he's talking about seed, he's talking about the nature of God. The very nature of God comes to live within the person who begins to follow Christ. And we often use the terminology of praying and inviting Christ into your life, praying and inviting Christ into your heart, receiving Christ. John said that. He wrote that in John chapter 1. Uh, there, there's all kinds of, Paul wrote in Colossians, it's Christ in you that's your hope of glory. So this idea of, of the nature, the life of God coming to live within us, we, we looked at our bodies being the temples of the Holy Spirit, that our body is like a house and the Holy Spirit comes to live within. So it's God in us. Us. So no one who is born of God will continue to sin. What that simply means is will not live an ongoing lifestyle of sin. I like what Chuck Swindoll said. I heard this years ago. It just makes so much sense. A person who is a Christian and a follower of Christ does not become sinless. They just start sinning less. Because it's growth. It's growth. 
Because God's nature, God's very nature, uh, that seed remains in us. They cannot, cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Uh, Now, verse 10. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. So John is making this very clear black and white distinction here. You know, these are his words, they're not mine, but listen to what he said. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Now, who gets to define what's right? God, not me. It's, it's, it's not a collection of, you know, no denomination should be getting together and deciding what's right and wrong. It's already been decided for us. We're, we're not the authors of that document. Uh, at least that's the way that I look at it, and uh, that's helped me for 42 plus years. Anyway, so anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and their sister. So what I want you to see is how John tied doing what's right and love together. Now, you can do what's right for somebody without loving them, I think. But you can't love somebody without doing what's right for them. If I love you, I am not going to help you rob a bank. (laughs) If I love you, I'm not going to help you go out and buy some drugs. If I love you, I am not, you know, if you love me, you're not going to help me to do anything that's not right. Right? That makes sense? I mean, it's a simple concept. That's what he's saying. He's he's wanting us to think this through. But look at this. Uh, God has put his nature within us, and his nature, John tells us a little bit later in 1 John, God is love. God is love. So John's thinking about, oh, what's all the, how can you describe what God is? God is love. God is love. Everything that God does is born out of love. Even the tough and difficult things that he does. Sometimes parents who love their children have to make difficult decisions on behalf of their children. Is that not true? Did not your parents have to make difficult decisions? Mine did because of some choices that I made. And, and, and that, that's just true. That's part of uh, the, the nature of, uh, of, that, uh, of that. So doing what's right and loving uh, are, are joined together at the hip. Now, now just keep in mind, look, look what he's, this is what he's saying. He has given us his nature. He has given us his seed. He has put the very nature, his very nature. Our lives have been joined together with his. And we've, we've, we've got a new life. We've come alive. So now, you do not plant a corn seed and grow ragweed. This, this is the profound thought for the day. You put a corn seed in the ground, ragweed does not come up from that seed. It's the nature of the seed. The seed is going to produce whatever that seed is. Now this is what John is saying. The seed of God. The very nature of God comes to live within a follower of Christ, and it changes that person's life. Now, it's a growth process. It's not like all of a sudden, it's just, you know, when you're born into this world, you don't come out walking and running. When you're born into this world, you don't come out talking. When you're born into this world, it's, it's, it's a long growth process. There's growing pains, and there's, you know, uh, hopefully it's in the context of a loving family, right? So uh, we do that. Now, I was thinking about this in in, in relationship to um, what we're talking about. My wife thought this was a little catchy, so I got her thumbs up. I sometimes run things by her. So anyway, the human nature you received. Anybody in here not human? Okay, I don't, I don't think there's any aliens here. So, The human nature you received is the result of what was conceived right, by the union of a man and a woman. This much is easy to believe. The new life you receive at the moment you believe is the result of what was conceived by God. So don't be deceived. 
That's what John's saying. This is how we can tell who the children of the Father are and the children of the devil. Whoever does not do what is right and whoever does not love uh, uh, their brother and their sister. So God's love is poured, literally put within us. It's put within us. So now love requires some things from us. I've I've got a coffee cup on my desk in my office that says, that asks this question, what does love require of me? What does love require of me? Love requires some things from us. This is also in 1 John chapter 3. This is how we know what love is. How, How do we know what love is? It's not by listening to pop music. It's not by watching romantic movies or rom-coms. It's not... uh, Most of what's portrayed in love today is not love. It's, It's, I love what you do for me. I love what you do to me. I was thinking of the song uh, by Blue Suede, Hooked on a Feeling. I thought about playing that this morning, you know, like... Uh, hooked on B.J. Thomas sang it too. Hooked on a fe- uh, you know how, that you're in love with me, you know, and I like this feeling that I get thinking that you love. So we're more in love with the feeling of being in love than because love love sacrifices, love gives of itself, love lays down its life for its brother and sister, love sometimes does not have happy feelings with it. Love can be very painful and very difficult. So look at what John wrote. This is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Now, Jesus didn't just lay down his life at the cross, although that he, he, uh, he did. He laid down his life every day for us. He laid down his life for us. If anyone, now listen, now here's the practical, uh, this is what he's talking about here. He's not talking about, hey, let's go out and, and die for each other. Um, what he's saying is, look at this is verse 17. If anyone has material possessions, anybody here have material possessions? I'm sure you do. All right? If anyone has, so this, this applies to anyone who has material possessions. <laughs> okay, so this is like written to you and... Me. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or a sister in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in that person? Stop. Now, it's easy to say, oh, that poor, pitiful person, and think that's what it means to have pity on him. No, he, he takes it a step further. Um, Dear children, let's not love with words or speech. Oh, poor you. <laughs> but with actions and in truth. That, that, that's a theme that goes throughout uh, the documents of the New Testament. These men that spent time with Jesus and watched Him love people sacrificially every day of their life that they spent with Him and saw the ultimate sacrifice of Him laying down His life, bearing their sins in His body on that tree. The punishment that brought them peace fell on Him. The same punishment that brings us peace fell on Him. They saw that. They were witnesses to it. They watched it. They experienced it. And then they went out and changed the world with it. Not just with speech, but with actions and in truth. So what does love require? Uh, Simply to follow Christ's example. That's verse 16 of what we just read. And to be generous. That's how I I summarize that. To be generous with what we have. To be generous. Not just at an annual campaign that we have in the fall, but to be generous. You see somebody in need. How, how, how can you have love? Be willing you know, to, to do something about it. Um, there, there, we, we could spend a lot of time on that. So love requires some things from me. Anyone who is following Jesus will follow his example of love. You, you cannot claim to be a follower of Christ and not follow his example of love because if you're not following his example of love, think this logically with me, then you're not following Jesus. 
Does that make sense? It's like, yeah, like, duh, thanks for that insight today, Pastor. Um, and anyone who is following Jesus will follow his command to love one another. And, and, and by the way, look, look, I love this. I love the way Jesus and subsequently his followers that were there with him, they kind of like boiled everything down, boiled everything down. And this is the way John said it. And this is his command. This, this is, this is, look, I spent three years with Jesus. I listened to him every day for those three years. This is what he commands. The, the, you ready? This is the summary. This is it. To believe in the name of his son, to believe in him, and to love one another as he commanded us. So that's how John summed it up. This is his command. This is the command of the Father, to believe in the name of his son Jesus, and to love one another as he commanded us. Believe in and thus follow Jesus in the example of love. Now back to 1, John, or 1 Thessalonians 4, the passage that we looked at. We're also going to look at briefly at Ephesians chapter 3. I love, I love this. this. is one of my favorite verses. And by the way, I pray this for all of us frequently. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 6 through 19. I pray it not because uh, you're, you're not a loving people. You've proven yourself to be a loving people over and over. Uh, but look at what Paul prays and then what he instructed the Thessalonian followers. If this is Ephesians 3, I pray that out of his glorious riches, um, lavishness, that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That means be at home uh, through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established, or some translations say grounded in love, being rooted in love. So, <laughs> Uh, the, the, the roots of a plant go down and it gets the nourishment from the soil. So he's saying, I want your nourishment to be coming from the love of God. Isn't that, isn't that cool? And, and so I want you to be rooted and established in love and may that you may have power together with all of Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and deep and high is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. You're going to be filled with the Spirit. You're going to be filled to the fullness of God. Practice love, because God is love. So expanding that love uh, within us in our ability to, to receive more and more of God's love in our heart. If you know God loves you a little bit, He wants to expand that. And, you know, 10 years from now, when you know it a whole lot more, he wants to expand it even more. Because you'll never exhaust. Be like drinking from the ocean if it was drinkable water. Just keep drinking. You're not going to make a dent in it. <laughs> You're not going to suck it dry. Uh, and then your capacity, our capacity to love others can also be expanded. This is back to 1 Thessalonians 4 where we started. And this is what he wrote. Now about your love for one another, I don't really need to write you because you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you. Now he's writing to people who are demonstrating, that are full of love. But we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. Just don't, don't be content with where... It's kind of like be content with where you are, but grow in that. Find more ways to love, to expand that, to, uh, uh, to expand it on an ever-increasing number of people. Now, lastly, love should be our trademark. Walmart's trademark used to be falling prices. I'm not questioning whether that's true or not. It seemed to me most of their prices kept going up when they said they were falling. I don't know. Um, so, you know, trademarks can be just what you want people to think when it may not be true. I shop at Walmart all the time, so I'm not knocking Walmart. Um, but love should be our trademark. Now, remember what John said earlier 
uh, just boiled it all down, summed it all up. What's the command? Now, this, this is from the lips of Jesus himself. John, who wrote that a few minutes ago that we looked at in 1 John, got this from Jesus. And Jesus said, a new command I give you. Which kind of like, who has the authority to give new commands? I thought only God. Oh, okay. Um, a new command I give you. Love one another. Love one another. Love one another as I have loved you. So what's the example? Jesus. Don't love maybe like your dad loved you or your mom loved you or didn't love you. Love like I've loved you. Let that be the example. By this, now look at this, verse 35. By this, what? Loving one another, the way Jesus loves us. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you have love for one another. Sometimes we think when I pull out of my car at 10.30, 10.45 on a Sunday morning, people will think, I must be a follower of Christ because I'm going to church. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said it's by love. It's by love. It's by love. If you want somebody to know you're a follower of Christ, follow the way of love. Follow the one who loves. Follow his example. Follow that. Love one another. Any so-called group of followers of Christ, individually or collectively, that does not genuinely and deeply love one another are guilty of false advertising. <clears throat> Should be taken to court. Because what's the genuine trademark of a follower of Christ, according to Jesus? Love. How? The way He loves us. I don't know about you, but I know I'm not there yet. I know I'm not where I used to be. I also know I'm not there yet. I want that to increase and abound in me more and more. So how do you let Christ's love into your heart? By letting Him into your heart. You don't have to jump through religious hoops. You don't have to go through any rituals. You receive Christ. You receive Him. You say, Lord, I believe. I believe that you died for me, that you gave your life on that cross, that anyone that believes in you would not perish. By believing in you and thus following you, you pour your spirit, you put your presence, you put your seed within us. Your life comes into us, and we, 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 we receive a new life. 